Well, great, let's, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone, uh, and thank you for joining. My name is Farhana Husseini, and I am the Director of Programs and Climate Initiatives at Waterfront Alliance. Uh, just a little bit about Waterfront Alliance. Waterfront Alliance is a US-based nonprofit organization with a growing alliance of more than 1,100 partners that focuses on environmental and economic development and bringing about real change to shorelines, waterfronts, and coastlines across the nation and in New York and New Jersey. Uh, for Climate Week, the Waterfront Alliance has been holding several different webinars, uh, panels, and art exhibits that have been centering critical climate resilience issues facing New York City. Uh, we welcome you to visit our website uh, to learn more about our events this week. Today's webinar uh, is entitled Redlining and Flooding, Breaking the Cycle of Disinvestment. And we'll be exploring the connection between redlining and flood vulnerable neighborhoods and through understanding the history, we hope uh, to discuss how this connection is a consequence of systemic racism and inequity that has persisted for generations. This panel will dive into the ways in which neighborhoods are prepared for the climate crisis and how to approach this in the future. During the webinar, you'll see a Q&A box all the way at the bottom. Um, please feel free to drop in questions there and we'll get to them at the end of the webinar. And now it is my honor to introduce all of you to our panelists today. Ariana Salazar Miranda is a assistant professor of urban planning and data science at the Yale School of Environment. Her research focuses on the relationship between urban planning, the built environment, human behavior and sustainability. Ariana has developed digital tools in partnership with cities and communities to inform their sustainability efforts. Candida Rodriguez is the Director of Community Engagement and Communications at Groundwork Hudson Valley. In her role, she focuses on fostering community partnerships and enhancing communication strategies to support the organization's mission of creating sustainable environmental change in urban neighborhoods. Chauncey Young has been an education organizer since 2004, so that's going on two decades, um, and has contributed to various initiatives and coalitions aimed at improving schools in District 9 and across New York City. He has held leadership roles in multiple organizations, coordinated significant campaigns, and is also the coordinator of the Harlem River Working Group, which focuses on environmental quality and accessibility of the Harlem River. As a parent and resident of the High Bridge neighborhood, Chauncey remains committed to enhancing education quality and community well-being. And Gita Nandan is an architect designer, educator, and leader in community resilience planning and design. She is a co-founder and principal of the award-winning design firm, Red Collective. Gita is also the chair of the Resilient Red Hook Committee and the board chair of the Ready Center. Her, her work focuses on integrating social, cultural, and economic issues with high design principles to create innovative, net positive urban environments. A huge thank you to our incredible panelists for being here today. And without further ado, would love to jump into the discussion. So to set the stage and get a better understanding between redlining and flood vulnerability, um, can you explain how redlining practices have historically contributed to the current flood and heat vulnerabilities of certain neighborhoods? Um, Gita, would love to start with you. Sure. Um, it's a very big topic, um, you know, and one that has multiple dimensions to it and multiple um, issues and really impacts each community in a different way um, and each of our coastal communities in a different way. But I think just generally and broadly, like we should really understand the statistics behind the idea of sort of like redlining and who is impacted and how they're impacted. Um, and I sort of come from and work in a low-lying community myself. I live in Red Hook. I work in Red Hook, um, in addition to many other coastal communities where our firm has been working. 
Um, but just statistically, like for those of you that don't know, there are 1.3 million people living in the floodplain currently um, and or, or adjacent. And by 2100, that will double. So we'll go to 2.2 million residents of New York City, um, over half of which are non-white or identify as non-white, um, and over half of which are uh, fall within um, sort of the poverty line or considered to be low-income residents. So, you know, there's a very clear overlap between environmental justice issues, um, you know, this historic mapping of redlining, um, and then this like current, I can't even say future anymore, right? Current condition of um, uh, uh, climate change and, you know, being at the forefront of coastal vulnerability. So I think like just, we just need to sort of know that and that is the frame sort of for the discussion today in terms of, you know, how much of our city is really going to be impacted um, and is actually, it's not going to be, it is impacted, you know, as we speak now. That's really helpful um, and, and great framing. And I would love to sort of dig a little bit deeper into specific neighborhoods. Um, Candida, Chauncey, Chaunce, both of you are working in both, you know, very, you know, both in, in the High Bridge and in, um, in Yonkers. Would love to hear more about your experiences there. Sure, I can jump in. Afternoon all, Chauncey. Um, I live in the High Bridge neighborhood of the Bronx. I work uh, with the Harlem River Working Group along all community boards uh, bordering the Harlem River. So on the Bronx side, that's Community Board 1, Mont Haven, Port Morris, uh, Community Board 4, the Concourse, High Bridge, Community Board 5, University Heights, uh, and then 7 and 8, Kingsbridge Heights, uh, Riverdale. So, you know, near, you know, when you think about the Bronx, it's considered the greenest borough. You know, we have the two largest, two of the largest parks in the city, uh, but we also have that inequal, inequitably uh, distributed based on a lot of those red lining principles, right? So the South Bronx, um, Community Board 5, just north of the Washington Bridge. Um, these communities have very small access to parks and green spaces. Um, that impacts flooding uh, because if you have hardened surfaces, more likely to flood. Um, we also have um, you know, a lot of streams that used to exist in the Bronx and still exist. So there are areas that flood, uh, including the, you know, entire Deegan Expressway during Superstorm Ida, uh, you know, we had cars floating down the, uh, the Harlem, uh, the, the, the um, uh, uh, I-87, uh, Major Deegan Expressway, because of issues of flooding and, and not enough ability to deal with runoff. Another issue connected to this, though, is also around our heat index. Because these areas don't have a lot of trees, a lot of tree coverage, um, we have a lot of pavements, um, and we have communities where we don't always have access to air conditioning. You know, there are there's an issue around climate in both flooding and in and in heat uh, impacts for communities. So we're working right now with that with the mayor's office of uh, climate and environmental justice, really looking at both of those issues um, and. Also, just connecting and access to our waterfront is our main issue that we're working on, really trying to develop a greenway and water access. Um, you know, we have no access to the water uh, currently. Um, and, you know, in a community that is 62 out of 62 counties in terms of New York State, in terms of health disparities, this impacts everything. I'll pass it on. Thanks, Chauncey. Thank you all. Um, it's great being here. Uh, my name is Candida Rodriguez. Uh, similar to Chauncey, I feel like we share a lot of similarities, um, you know, with the Bronx and Yonkers. Uh, Yonkers, I'll give a very brief, you know, overview and historical <laughs> overview of Yonkers. Yonkers is a medium-sized city, is the third largest city in New York State with a population of a little bit over 200,000. Um, it has a quite unique layout. It's um, you know, older urban areas are concentrated in Southwest Yonkers near the Hudson River. 
um, and newer, more suburban neighborhoods are in the uh, east and northwest side of Yonkers. Um, it's also quite a hilly city with a lot of the wealthier, predominantly white neighborhoods often sitting at higher elevations. And then the low income, predominantly Black Latino neighborhoods located in the low lying areas. So, you know, before Yonkers has a history of being an industrial city, um, it was home to factories like the Otis Elevator. Um, and it was also impacted by redlining. And then uh, further to that, school and housing segregation that persisted well into the early 2000s. Actually, um, in 1980, the Department of Justice sued the city of Yonkers for housing and school segregation with the uh, NAACP stepping in in 1981. And after about uh, like a 30 year battle, a settlement was reached in 2007, I believe, um, where the city agreed to build 800 units of public housing in predominantly white areas of East and Northwest Yonkers. And this case was highly controversial and actually HBO made a series about it um, called Show Me a Hero, which I highly recommend watching. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, how is this manifesting today in present day Yonkers? Well, we still see that Southwest Yonkers, that more urban um, where black and Latino uh, communities live or are concentrated in are hotter during heat waves. Um, there's a lot of pavement, you know, similar to parts of New York City, the Bronx including. Uh, it lacks clean green spaces and also even access to these clean green spaces. And when it rains, it pours. The water comes rushing down higher areas into the low-lying neighborhoods, uh, flooding buildings, homes, roads, you name it. Um, so that's how it's, you know, manifesting today. It's not so far back. Um, you know, the early 2000s is still not that long ago, and we're still seeing some of those impacts today. I really appreciate that perspective. I think it's uh, it's good to have, you know, on the ground realities um, and and share what's, what's happening very locally. Uh, to take it a little bit broader, Ariana, would love for you to sort of share a little bit more about the, <clears throat> the national landscape. And, uh, and what are some of the key findings that you've um, you've learned through your research? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. So Chauncey and Candida have already sort of give, gave us a lot of information about specific case studies, right? And so my work, actually, we were interested in um, how the legacy of redlining impacts climate vulnerability, but at a national scale. And so what we did is we analyzed all of the maps for over 200 cities, and we overlaid them with high resolution data on heat and flooding for each property. Now, the challenge is that we can't simply compare redlined areas to non-redlined areas, because the thing is that we know that redlined areas, as, you know, as Candida was saying, are already like lower income populations and have other different sociodemographics that make them very different in terms of environmental risk to those that are not redlined. And so if we compare them directly, then we might be assuming that like redlined affected you know, vulnerability, but we might, there might be other attributing factors that we can worry about. And so what we did is we focused on properties that were right at the border, but that fall on opposite sides of the historical red line boundaries. And so imagine two houses on the same block, maybe even the same street, they have this, they're in the same city, they share the same climate, same elevation. And the only thing that differs is whether they were redlined or not. And so this method allowed, allowed us to isolate the effect of redlining on the, from these other factors. And so what we show is very consistent with the case studies too, right? We find that lower graded areas, those D neighborhoods, are facing significantly higher flood risks and are also exposed to heat relative to the A graded neighborhoods. And so I think, you know, taken together, what we learn is that there is what I would say is strong evidence suggesting that redlining continues to, you know, um, affect these communities and puts them at a disadvantage, right, when it comes to climate resilience. 
I mean, and of course, the natural next question is then, wh why is this happening, right? Why is it on the ground that makes these places vulnerable? And I have thoughts on this too, but perhaps I'm going to save them for um, for the next couple of questions and we can talk more about the mechanisms later on. Fantastic. I really do appreciate the sort of connections that all of you are making um, to both redlining and then also just sort of climate climate hazards and the, and the vulnerability to climate hazards. So to go a bit further, um, could could you share actually some a little bit more about how these cycles of disinvestment continue to influence uh, urban planning and disaster preparedness in flood, pro, pro, uh, flood prone areas today? Um, Candida, would love to sort of start with you. Yeah, um, so, we know that you know there are parts of Yonkers that were formerly redlined, uh, and these neighborhoods are found in lower line, sometimes even flood prone areas. Um, but there's also, like many other cities in uh, across the nation, and similarly to New York City, there's a lot of old infrastructure in Yonkers. Um, there's also you know an outdated drainage systems and um, combined sewer system similar to New York City, uh, that can't necessarily handle so much uh, rainfall. Um, and because much of the urban landscape is paved, uh, you know, there's a lot of parking lots, roads, just concrete and paved surfaces, it's really hard for that water to be absorbed, um, contributing to things like runoff and uh, sewer overflows. Uh, so there is a very clear lack of the necessary infrastructure, the investment in, you know, updating these infrastructures um, because of historical disinvestment happening in these neighborhoods. Uh, therefore, they're not able to recover as quickly as other neighborhoods can. You know, we've done, Groundwork Hudson Valley has done uh, a great job at addressing these issues. Um, we daylighting, we daylighted the Salma River uh, in downtown Yonkers. That was our flagship project mm -hmm. that really kickstarted. Um, and today we're continuing that. We're making sure that we're implementing green infrastructure projects, especially stormwater infrastructure uh, projects that uses nature to address these issues in vulnerable communities, especially those neighborhoods that were formerly redlined and have um, been part of that cycle of disinvestment. You know, we work with many different partners like the Municipal Housing Authority of the city of Yonkers to address both extreme heat and flooding. Um, and while the city of Yonkers has done a lot to address these issues uh, and also to right some of these wrongs, there is, I think, you know, it's important to think of the continuation of that and you know to continue thinking about how to redesign our urban areas in a way that addresses uh, extreme heat and flooding but particularly flooding because it's happening so often similar to to extreme heat but you know flood flooding does a lot of damage um and if people can't recover from flooding it's it just sets them up for you know other uh, potential uh, hazards in, in both economically and with their health and their livelihood. I really appreciate that point about recovery. I think uh, I think it's really critical. Um, just how much the continuous cycle of disinvestment sort of happens with uh, with issues like flooding. Um, Chauncey, I see that you are outside by the, uh, the Harlem out River. Along the Harlem River in River Chicomete State Park. That's because we're getting 200 public school kids out on the Harlem River today in canoes. Um, I'm I stepped out because we have it's been raining today. So some of the students came into the classroom that I was working out of uh, to uh, eat their lunch because uh, everything is wet. But um, I, I do think it's actually important that I'm in the state park here because River Chicamente State Park was severely damaged by Superstorm Sandy. Um, and where I'm standing right now is on a, a wetland that was built, an artificial wetland that was built after Superstorm Sandy. And that is to, you know, one, it's a beautiful education space. You can see the fiddler clubs. 
uh, crawling on the rocks here. Um, but it also is uh, around uh, a green infrastructure project to stop the flooding of this park. Um, because during Superstorm Sandy, the recreation center had, uh, you know, four to five feet of water in uh, the, the first floor. Uh, you know, we needed to put $200 million of renovations into this park. Um, after Superstorm Sandy, it is an incredible park, uh, but it just sort of shows the impact of flooding and of storms that can happen. It also, um, to point out that this park is along the waterfront, but the community itself is cut off from this park because we have the Metro North line and we have the Deegan Expressway that cuts the community off from the waterfront. So, so much infrastructure continuing of redlining has occurred in the Bronx where not just the Deegan Expressway, but our um, Oak Point line, uh, which is a line of a red line, which we call the garbage train, that runs 1.9 miles in the water, uh, you know, cutting off community members from the water so that you can't get out for water activities, you can't really touch the water's edge. Um, and we've also successfully, similar to Yonkers, where we work with the city and we are daylighting uh, Tibbetts Brook. It's going to be the largest uh, green infrastructure um, project, the largest daylighting project in the country. Um, we're taking a brook that has been under the water, under, under in the sewer system for over 100 years, and we're going to be taking that up and building the Putnam Greenway extension from Van Cortlandt Park uh, to 230th Street, but again, a continued continuation of redlining that's occurring is that so much infrastructure from Manhattan, uh, from uh, Grand Central, has been put on the Harlem River waterfront to the south of us, just south of the High Bridge, the uh, Metro North car washing station was built there in 2004, taking 60 acres of our waterfront. Uh, to wash cars, train cars that used to be washed in um, in Grand Central. Uh, and then um, if that's not enough, uh, so that's a huge issue for us, creating a linear greenway and, and creating access to the community. North of us, that at, uh, the, the connection of that greenway from 230th Street to 225th Street, five blocks of land, um, is not owned by by, um, by CXX, which sold the property to the city, but is owned by Metro North. Um, I'll just give you a beautiful view of our students canoeing as I'm, I'm talking here for a moment. So we have that Metro North has decided with the, with the Grand Central Madison uh, restructuring, which is allowing them to bring trains from Long Island directly into Grand Central, that space that they put to put those additional tracks in Grand Central, they needed to move the trash management out of uh, out of Grand Central. And where did they move it to? They moved it to the Bronx. So they broke an agreement that they had with the city to transfer those five blocks of land over to the city to create the completed greenway. And they decided that the Bronx don't need access to uh, our waterfront um, and to create a linear greenway because it's more important that Metro North is managing trash from Connecticut, uh, Westchester, um, Long Island, and Manhattan um, in the Bronx. Um, and, you know, and at what we believe that they're doing is we believe they're trucking, taking trucks from that location, driving down to waste management in the, in the South Bronx. So more pollution, on our community, more asthma for our community when we have some of the highest rates of asthma in the country. Um, and then um, putting that in the garbage train that we already take one quarter of New York City's trash is carried out on that garbage train. So, you know, again, these are these are issues that are all connected, right? Where, you know, some communities are seen as less important than others. Some communities don't need access to the waterfront. You know, this canoeing program that we're doing, we do once a year. We, we bring these canoes from the Mississippi River as part of a national canoeing program. And for the rest of the year, Bronx residents along the West Bronx have no access 
to recreational boating. So for folks who live in the Hudson River, uh, who live on the East River, who live in Brooklyn, who live in Staten Island, there's free kayaking, canoeing programs. We have nothing in the Bronx other than this one program, one day, one you know, one week out of the year that we're getting students out on the water. So health uh, priorities, uh, environmental priorities, and the last I was saying is the Army Corps of Engineer plan uh, that was building, uh, you know, seawalls to protect areas in Manhattan. Um, you know, as we we looked at the contradictions between the plans. In Manhattan, they were lifting up uh, parks and developing greenway paths. In the Bronx, uh, we were getting a seawall uh, that was cutting off our community from the waterfront um, and basically allowing the Bronx in a lot of ways to be that flood zone. So in case of a major storm surge, our communities would get flooded uh, in some areas and in other areas, they didn't even look to see that we we're going to put a seawall blocking off our community from the Hip Hop Museum, from the Pond Park, and from the Children's Museum. That was the original plan. Um, so these are these are the continuing planning issues that go on. Um, and you know, in terms of greenway and waterfront access, the city is now committed to putting a billion dollars into reviewing the Manhattan waterfront, reconnecting community members. Uh, to the waterfront and creating a clean, continuous greenway path around the whole of Manhattan. Um, and we've gotten zero dollars uh, for, you know, similar uh, funding for greenways in the Bronx. So this planning inequity happens, continues to happen in, uh, in, in communities across the city and certainly something we want to lift up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I think it's really it's really great to hear how there's continuous cycles of disinvestment uh, that is that is facing the Bronx. And these examples are, are so critical. And I genuinely appreciate being able to experience watching these students on, on the water with you. So thank you so much for sharing that with us as well. Um, Ariana, I would love to also hear from you about how data science and technology can be leveraged uh, to identify and address the vulnerabilities of neighborhoods affected by redlining. Yeah, that's that's an area that I'm particularly excited about. I work precisely at the intersection of data science and urban planning. And I do think that there is a lot of potential for new technologies and new data sources to sort of to use them in order to study climate vulnerability. And I think we are starting to do this at a way that we haven't been able to do it before. And so um, maybe one thing I can do is share, you know, a couple of examples of how I've been integrating this kind of information in the work that I've done on redlining. And so one example is, for example, the first street foundation uh, flood and heat models. So these give us property level assessments or maps of flooding and heat risk for all of the US. And it's at the property level, which I think is unprecedented. And the nice thing is that these maps consider everything from rainfall, uh, river flow, high tides, coastal surges, or it even considers future climate scenarios. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of sort of high resolution data helps us not only map current vulnerabilities, but also predict which neighborhoods will have, you know, the burdens of climate change in the future. And so we've also, so that's sort of more on the, on the models and the mapping, but we've also used images to explore sort of why certain neighborhoods are more exposed to heat and flooding. And so for instance, we've measured things like tree canopy coverage. We've also measured street level vegetation, um, ground surface permeability at a very granular level. I think one of the most sort of exciting parts of this is being able to pair the data with, the, with new technologies. And so um, just to give you sort of an example of how we've used these images, we um, gathered street level uh, images with computer vision, and then we can process these images to create very detailed maps at the street level of all the trees that exist, right? And so I do think that sort of having access to this high resolution data 
allows us to get a much clearer picture of what's happening on the ground. And I think one of the potentials of all of this information is if we can connect it to communities and empower them so that they can advocate for change or inform ongoing policies with you know, data that is um, that sort of reflects the conditions on the ground. So I think sort of that's what I would say about the potential and excitement of, of sort of new data sources and, and pairing them with technology. I think that's a really great point. Um, I think it's really important that we have the, the data to back up a lot of what we're sort of advocating for and, and the maps as well. And, and so just the fact that you've been able to put some of this, uh, this these materials together, I think is really powerful. Um, so going to uh, going to Gita, um, as a as a architect and designer, um, we've heard, we've heard from Chauncey and Candida about some of the significant impacts of redlining to the communities that they work with, and um, and you know really understanding some of the potential solutions. Would would love to hear how urban design and architect architecture can sort of address the legacy of redlining. Uh, and improve the resilience in flood vulnerable neighborhoods. Um, yeah, so it's like I don't even know exactly where to start because it's such a big topic and such a big issue. I, I think, and I, I want to also add in to this conversation is, um, and this sort of relates to urban planning and architecture, but um, you know, one of the big issues that we have witnessed over the past decades since, since Superstorm Sandy relates really to um, this issue of insurance or sort of blue lining, right? And so the, the big issue with redlining was obviously a, a disinvestment in communities based on mortgages and the availability of insurances, right? And so it then has now directly uh, uh, been transmuted onto this issue, the same issue, but related to uh, the same houses in floodplains, right? And so often it can be very hard to get insurance or insurance ends up becoming very, very expensive because of, um, you know, uh, recurring flood issues. And yet these are people that are being impacted in low-lying, you know, low-income communities. Um, my community being one of them, Candida's, Chauncey's, we are all experiencing the exact same issue. What happens then is people will either sell um, or they will have to leave because they are finding that the insurance is not affordable anymore. And so therefore what happens is sincere gentrification. And so what we're finding actually is in parallel to this is a gentrification of our communities that um, is by no means a, a choice or a decision by low income or low lying communities, but it's sort of put upon them because the costs are untenable. And, you know, I think one of the big questions we as society have to ask ourselves is, is there a way to address this at the, at the larger societal scale, right? Do we as a society need to really think about this in terms of what is the greater responsibility um, you know, and how do we ensure that um, these low lying communities, which are incredibly vulnerable, even with blue lining and, and red lining, that, you know, the solution is not for wealthier people to come in and build and create, you know, very expensive structures that can be built above the floodplain that can, you know, potentially withstand some level of, you um, of you know resilience and storm impact and and can be built very green and you know so so while that is a design solution it's not um you know it's not okay because it's often only by done by those who can afford you know the very high dollar per square foot it requires to build that so i think that's a very complicated question but the issues around gentrification of low-lying communities is a very real one um, and one that we have to consider, you know, and so, and that, you know, from an architectural perspective, like there are some solutions that we can offer um, both existing communities and uh, 
you know, communities that are both building, redesigning existing structures and building new structures. I think what's also really important to consider is as we are, and if we are building larger scale projects in low-lying communities, so we can name right now a number of city funded projects, you know, DEP funded projects, um, uh, and projects that can really integrate community scale resilience, right? And so we should really be designing and building projects that don't just create structures unto themselves that um, are resilient or flood, you know, uh, climate adaptive, but ones that really help the entire community. Um, and there are many strategies to do that, but it takes a little forethought. It takes um, uh, vision. It takes, you know, a willingness to spend a little bit more because you are doing it at that community scale. Um, but, you know, that's a different approach than just making the site itself climate adaptive, um, which is also very important, obviously. Um, but those, I think, from an urban planning, that's sort of where the urban resilience planning and architecture need to sort of go hand in hand and be connected. Um. I think that's really helpful. Um, I also I also feel like there's an additional need for general community engagement. And I really do appreciate that you're you're highlighting that, uh, Gita. Um, Candida, I would love to hear more about what kinds of strategies that you found most effective in engaging communities that have been historically marginalized due to redlining. And then and maybe Gita would love to hear about how sort of Thread Collective sort of bridges that gap as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I do want to say that it's, you know, to a point that Ariana uh, mentioned, uh, data is really important, um, especially at a very granular level because we've used a lot of the data of the redlining maps, of the flood you know, modeling, and it helps validate people's experiences, personal experiences, and it puts perspective to what they're um, currently experiencing with all you know, the extreme weather events. So we use them a lot um, and there's, a huge uh, fear of green gentrification, uh, you know, across many communities, and um, it's important to acknowledge these uh, fears and these experiences, um, and you know, to address this and to make sure that we are involving the community in a lot of our projects, especially when it comes to um, decision-making processes. We uh, try to bring in a lot of the community voices, especially from areas that are most affected. So uh, about two years ago, Groundwork um, established a working group, a community working group called the Climate Safe Yonkers Task Force um, in May, I think it was May, 2022. Um, it was a group of 30 diverse members of the community. We made sure that that community was representative of Yonkers and the communities that we worked in that we were trying to um, address a lot of these uh, climate issues. And they went through a series of training, of education, um, where not only were they educating themselves on a lot of these local issues that were impacting their neighborhoods, um, but they were provided with tools as to how to address these from a, you know, physical projects uh, options to policy uh, advocacy options. Um, but they also educated their communities and they brought that message out to their neighborhoods um, around you know, what are the climate risks, uh, how to prepare, what are some uh, potential strategies to help with a lot of these lived experiences. Um, the city of Yonkers involved us into the uh, planning and the development of the first uh, ever climate action plan, uh, which was great. Uh, and we know that involving community members in such a process is so important for buy-in of such a, a plan and understanding of like, what is the city trying to do? What is What are your goals? What are your strategies, you know? How are we reflected in that? And I think that was really crucial 
uh, that was a very strategic and uh, intentional decision that should be implemented across other uh, plans and other uh, um, other processes that uh, we know because a lot of the community members have a, they have lived experience they have local knowledge they have a lot of things um, that they see day to day that perhaps we don't and they can provide us with some insights into how to address these issues. Uh, so building on that success of the Climate Task Force, we decided to branch out and do two new working groups uh, focused on very specific topics to still engage the community around these issues. Uh, one of the working groups is focused on air quality in Yonkers, and the other is on expanding the tree canopy uh, as well. And what we've noticed is that this model of having a task force of you know including training and the tools uh, to the community is that it empowers people uh, and builds their capacity and just adds to their their local knowledge. Chauncey, uh, Gita, do you, Ariana, do you want to jump in? I can jump in just for a moment. I think. You know, in the in the work that we do with community, I think the key thing is for us is to make sure that we are, um, you know, getting out into the community itself. Um, you know, making sure that representative, exactly as uh, you know, was mentioned before, but also interpretation. Um, you know, for the Bronx, uh, you know, sixty percent of the community members do not speak English as a first language, and while the majority of those members may be speaking Spanish. We also have a very large Bengali community, a very large West African community. Um, and so really ensuring that not just documentation is provided in multiple languages, but understanding that a lot of our community members might not read or write in any language. And so, you know, verbal communication is really important and having um, having folks who speak, uh, you know, the West African languages, of uh, indigenous languages from South and Central America are really important um, because it's very easy in these conversations to prioritize, um, you know, the community members who are technologically savvy and who can jump on a Zoom, um, you know, and feel comfortable using their computer or their iPad. But it's also really important to make sure that we're getting out to community members um, in parks, at events, going to mosques, churches, and other community organizations. Um, because if we don't go to folks in their own uh, spaces, um, it's very likely that we're not going to be including uh, everyone's voice. Um, and I think the other thing, and we've been somewhat successful in this, and you know, as a lot of development has happened also, we've seen failures in this too, is that you, know, you, you are working uh, you know, as a city has its own goals and the mayors have their own goals, um, you know, development happens and you can push back on things, but, you know, uh, different mayors have different priorities. So we, you know, have seen over the last 15 years that, you know, various mayor administrations have taken parkland and green space and turned it into affordable housing. Um, you know, and, and, you know, clearly that's not serving the greater community in that sense, but, you know, it's, it's difficult to push back as community members when, um, you know, there's large forces in play. Um, and a lot of the, you know, property that's been built in the South Bronx, uh, south of 149th Street, uh, 145th Street Bridge, you know, a lot of that is, you know, not necessarily for our community in the sense of like being affordable. Um, and, you know, again, we're building more property on on a waterfront area that probably would be better off served uh, thinking about green space and flood capture. Um, so, you know, there, there's it's not always a perfect, um, you know, perspective. We are working hard on that, but I think, you know, really is bringing together a lot of groups too, and a lot of organizations to put pressure on the city and, and developers to, you know, prioritize um, one that 
you know, we should be serving a community that lives in the area, not necessarily building property for a new, you know, community to move in. Um, and also that we should be working to make sure that anything that is built is going to be green and sustainable um, and supportive uh, for pedestrians to walk and bicycles to utilize space, not make more car-centric properties in an area where very few people own cars. Love it. <laughs> Ariana, did you have something else to share? Yeah, I just wanted to make a small comment related to the previous point about the importance of urban design and architecture, because I think we've mostly focused our conversation on the outdoors, right? We've talked about less tree coverage. We've also talked about surface permeability. But I think there's something to be said as well about, you know, indoors, like heat exposure indoors is also critical, especially as temperatures continue to rise. And I think you know, most of us spend the majority of our time indoors and in redlined areas, buildings can be less equipped to handle extreme heat. And so I do think, you know, thinking moving forward, I think we need to sort of think carefully about how we are going to improve insulation, ventilation, cooling systems so that we, you know, we improve the existing housing stock and help sort of citizens face and cope better with, with heat stress moving forward. So just wanted to you know, to bring in that perspective as well, because I do think we need to think about the outdoors and design, but it, we also need to bring in the existing housing stock and make sure that it's well equipped moving forward. Great point. Really appreciate you raising that. This issue, as well as air, indoor air pollution, I think combined together are things that we really need to be considering um, as we're designing. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for sharing. Um, so then this leads me to the question of systemic change. Uh, what policy changes do you believe are necessary to address the legacy of redlining um, and enhance both indoor and outdoor resilience um, to vulnerable neighborhoods? Um, Ariana, since would love to start with you and then we can, I'd love to hear from everyone. Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, this is, this is a tough one, but in, in general, I think we just need to think about policies that reinvest in things that reduce risk, right, and then improve infrastructure in these neighborhoods. I mean, some examples can be, you know, from increasing tree coverage, improving ground permeability um, through, you know, urban greening programs or better stormwater management, like all of these are going to boost flood resilience, right? And I think one way, at least from a planner's perspective, that we can do this is zoning, right? I think if we, a big part of this is that if we continue sort of prioritizing low density development with large driveways and parking lots, I think we will continue to sort of limit the space for climate resilient infrastructure, right? Like we know that single family housing has, you know, is gonna block water absorption. It's gonna just make it harder for us to justify investments in green solutions. So I think moving forward, it's a sort of a combination of making zoning and policies more flexible and allowing for higher density development that can help us create the infrastructure that we need to help communities adapt to climate change. That's what I would say. Somebody Someone else want to? <laughs> All right. Um, okay. No. Yeah, I'm Go ahead. If you were going to say something, I was just I like along the lines of what Ariana said, which was similar to what I was going to express as well. Is um, and I don't know quite how to word this, but you know we already have some really great policies in place. We are not, or we don't have the expectation of actually meeting them right now. Um, and very often city agencies have some, you know, we have some fairly high standards that we could uh, mandate. So for instance, there was a really great skate park that was built in my community. I had actually led a project with a couple of youth um, to turn it into a stormwater capture skate park. Parks department took it over. They put some, you know, nice bioswales next to it but it's not a stormwater capture park and it should be. That's what the community wanted. That's a design that we provided. 
in a design direction. And it still floods on the corner there, right? And so I actually think that while we need some policy changes, we actually just need to hold everybody to higher standards and higher expectations. And city agencies need to start to step up to the plate and actually be doing what we're asking them to do. If that skate park had been built as a you know, stormwater capture park like we wanted, our corner would not be flooded. We would be that much better off, right? We would actually be able to be capturing stormwater from all the adjacent properties. Like we actually have a lot of tools and we have a lot of solutions. We are just not implementing them or we're not paying for them or we're not finding the necessity to be able to, um, you know, mandate that they ought to be uh, a part of the urban planning and the design process. And so um, I'm not sure that we need a ton of new changes. I think we also need to have higher expectations. 100%. Yeah, I just want to jump in and say I completely agree with you. I mean, every every greenway that's been developed, you know, in the city could be done with forest pavement to be exactly. seen as rain really capture opportunities, every park path tree, tree could be lined, seen. Right? It's right. like, why isn't, why, why doesn't well, every greenway have, you know, a thousand trees across it? Why isn't every greenway being maintained and, and properly, 100%. you know, it's like there are trucks driving over the greenways in Red Hook. Like literally they're now being used as parking spots. I'm like, that is not okay. Like we need, once again, just expectations. <laughs> yes, right? yes. I mean, I agree that we have all the tools. It's really about implementing them. And it's it's not that we haven't been asking for it. It's about the city, you know, following through on on some of the goals and expectations that 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 they have. Um, you know, building Yankee Stadium, we built dozens of parking lots that have never been paid a day's worth of rent. You know, as community members, we said you should prioritize public transportation. We got a Metro North station out of it, a ferry dock that lasted for two years before the city decided it wasn't worth it. But, you know, we, we you know, people continue not to use those, those, those parking lots and parking garages that were built uh, to their full capacity because people would prefer to drive and park on the streets. So we need to create, you know, both among consumers and, and residents and among city planners and and you know city officials really be um following through on our goals for creating a greener city i think it's also around um creating the you know green roofs green infrastructure should be developed in all of our properties any mm -hmm. new building going up any old building you know older building you know, we, I live in a cooperative throughout the high bridge. There's very few green roofs and green infrastructure projects. Um, and yet there's limited funding for that. And the city and the state could be, you know, putting more money into those projects, which would in the end save the city and state thousands of dollars in flood damage um, and repairs. So it really is about prioritizing this. Thanks, Chauncey. Um, Candida, I know that you had a you had a comment too. Oh yeah, I I mean I was going to mention. I mean I, I agree with the points raised, uh, but also you know involving the community is from like the very beginning uh, is really important because a lot of the times these plans and these projects are great and you know they're new and people are excited for it, but they don't really ask people what they actually want and how they want, how they envision those spaces to be. Um, and a lot of the times these processes are just a formality check off. Um, so I think it needs to be intentional. It needs to be prioritized uh, and actually take people's, you know, feedback and inputs into consideration, not just like a, an afterthought. Um, so that's my, my <laughs> I'll get on my soapbox about that. Um, because it's, you know, involving the community is really important for people to actually care about these greenways and these projects um, that the city is implementing or suggesting. So yeah, that's that that was my only comment. <laughs> well, I just to just to sort of continue along that that path, I'd love to take some questions from the audience because we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, 
So one of the questions from the audience is for you actually, uh, Candida, inclusion is slow. Uh, how long did it take to set up the community task forces in the groundwork case? Were its members already politically active for the most part? Did you observe that community members were part of the task force and took part in education and training, yeah. felt more motivated to lead conversations and support other people in decision-making about climate risks? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the entirety of the task force, uh, before it was formed, I believe it was a, a year, it took about a year to form. Uh, I had joined Groundwork at the beginning of starting this working group. Um, so I believe that happened prior um, to that. And we created a model where uh, we put people through phases. So the educational uh, phase of teaching um, or training about, you know, like the more complex climate science and how is that related to Yonkers? And then about what are the potential solutions, interventions, both policy and projects? What, what could that look like in Yonkers based on our, our local uh, climate risks and and then being part of the uh, development of the Yonkers Climate Action Plan. It happened at the right moment. Now, it would have been, you know, the success of that task force was that it was, it just happened to also happen, uh, it just happened to be at that same moment of the development of the Yonkers Climate Action Plan and the city, the city included us into that process, which was great. So what does that look like, you know, and when it doesn't happen at the same time? Um, and I think that's really important to consider uh, setting up that uh, foundation of building folks um, capacity. And I do see a lot of the, the people that are part of the task force and the working group um, have gone on to do, you know, talks. They've been interviewed by local media. I can actually share some of the the, um, the articles written about them, their stories, um, they're sharing their stories of how, you know, this impacts their daily lives with the information and the materials that we've provided um, so that they can put a lot of the science to their lived experiences. Um, and we see that a lot of the folks, yes, there are some of them are very um, motivated and, and, and active in their communities, but there's also like college students that are part of this task force. Uh, who are just there to like learn more and don't necessarily have to, you know, do something about it. They just need to, they'd like to learn a little bit more, get some more information, um, and then they might do something about it later. So I think everyone has their own journey throughout this. Um, and that's the beauty of establishing a working group like that. Not everyone needs to be active. And the ones that are, it's great. You know, it's, it shows that they're really passionate and into this work. That's great. Thank you for thank you for sharing. Um, Keith, I would love to sort of address the next next question to you, which is somebody is thanking you for raising the issue of gentrification <laughs> um, and uh, and sort of the deployment post the deployment of green infrastructure. What are some of what what are some of the most promising policy approaches that you've come across to combat displacement related to uh, these infrastructure projects? Oh, you know, this is just a topic that always comes up the minute you talked about gentrification is like, how do you prevent it? Um, and first, I want to say, like, absolutely, I don't think that we should ever be considering not implementing green infrastructure or other measures that might have the perspective of gentrification in communities that provide resilience, like every community deserves and ought to come to sort of the ideas of greening or the ideas of, of, of you know, stormwater capture as a, as a right, right? Every community has a right to these tools and to these implementation efforts. Um, really the parallel process is that we need to address security when it comes to housing, right? And when it comes to affordability. And so, you can't sort of deal, have one without the other. You can't sort of have resilience measures and green infrastructure and you know stormwater capture and 
uh, climate adaptation measures that happen at the urban planning and architecture scale without addressing sort of the societal issues of affordability and ensuring that people can stay within the homes that they have, um, you know, or if they want to move on or if they want to move to a different community because of flooding issues, there needs to be pathways to allow that to happen within the means that they have. And so it's really two parallel things that need to happen simultaneous to each other. And I feel like we're so focused sometimes on just climate adaptation that we're not really focused in the same way around the economics, right? And around the societal economics, uh, how we function as a as a community to ensure that we can stay within the, the, the neighborhoods that we want to live in, right? Or the neighborhoods that we're committed to. And so it's sort of, they're, they may feel like they're not directly tied to each other, but in this situation, they are. Um, and that's the, the, that to me is the only way, we're, it's the only way we're gonna combat gentrification is if we can ensure affordability. I really appreciate that. And I think that is a wonderful note to end on. Um, we've uh, we've taken up a little bit more of your time, but really, really appreciate everyone joining today. A huge thank you <clears throat> to our panelists. So, so appreciative of your time. Um, and, uh, and there were a lot of questions, but, and unfortunately we weren't able to address all of them, but Happy to uh, happy to share the recording of this webinar as well as the resources shared by the uh, the panelists as well. Um, thank you again for joining and uh, and enjoy the rest of your climate week. Thank you, Waterfront Alliance, you, for putting everyone. this together. Yeah, great. Thank you all. Thanks, Chauncey. Bye, Ariana. Bye, Candida. Bye. Bye. Thank you.